I think, uh, can we get Rich, I think one of the lights, I think these side ones aren't on. My, my, I'm on the pulpit here. See these lights right here? I think there's a switch that should turn that on. Up, up here, this door right here. Go through this door. All right. Don't draw any attention to yourself while you're doing that. All right. Well, great singing, wonderful time. I pray that that was a blessing to you. Yeah, that's a little better, right? You can see me now? Unfortunately, he did it. It's okay. Today's message is perfect. Because <laughs> I forgive you. Can you open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3? We'll be looking at verses 12 through 17 this morning. Really, we're going to be looking at the subject of forgiveness, and the, the, the message is called Living in Peace with One Another. If you're visiting with us, we're, we're going through the one another's of the Bible. There's 50 of them. Uh, many of them are kind of repeated, and they kind of are grouped together in the four different groups, of, but they're all built on relationships. You realize as a, as a big bulk of, of the New Testament that we cannot practice on our own, but without having relationships with each other. And that is what these one another's are all about. And that is what we're trying to do, is to learn how we can improve our relationships with each other. Because if you know anything about relationships, they are hard to maintain. Relationships are hard to maintain. Oftentimes, we have a hard time getting along with each other. Consider the, two, the story here of these two porcupines. Two porcupines in northern Canada huddled together to get warm. According to the forest foretake, foretale, folktale, excuse me, I've got to fix my glasses here, but their quills pricked each other, so they moved apart. Before long, they were shivering because they were cold, so they slid back together again. Soon, both were getting jabbed again. Same story, same ending. They needed each other, but they kept on needling each other, right? Maybe you've heard this before, Charlie Brown and Peanuts cartoon. Lucy says to Snoopy, there are times when you really bug me. But I must admit, there are also times when I feel like giving you a big hug. And Snoopy replies, that's the way I am, huggable and buggable. You can use that, okay? So today we talk about how do we live in peace with one another. Peace. Paul uses two words or two graces, two ways of living in love and practicing love together and how we live in peace with one another. He, he says we ought to bear with one another, endure, right? Or put up with one another. Believe it or not, that's what it means as Christians. And we are to forgive one another. And so let me read verse 12 through verse 17. God's Word says to us this morning, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which, to which you also were called in one body, and be thankful." Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Lord, we are coming to you this morning and praying that you would bless us as we uh, 
learn about forgiveness today. May you have your way in our hearts and help me, Lord, to convey the truth of forgiveness and help your people to have good ears to hear and we would have a wonderful time of worshiping you as we hear your word and the teaching of forgiveness. And we wait upon you to feed us in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. So this morning, I'm going to teach on what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. And next Sunday, we'll go deeper and we're going to look at the consequences of things like like. What do you do? What does repentance mean? If you forgive somebody, what does repentance look like? What, is, what about the consequences of, of um, people's actions against us? And so all these relationship things about getting along and living in peace. Uh, reconciliation. Uh, what does it mean if you forgive somebody? Does that automatically mean that you are reconciled and there's no longer a wall in between you? These are all important things that we must understand. And so this morning, I'm just going to talk about forgiveness, what it is and what it is not. And usually, you know the way I teach. I'll teach the whole passage, right? I'm going to come back to the passage down the road. But there's, some, there's so many things that come up, questions that are going to come in your mind. I am going to open up a can of worms today. It's kind of a disgusting thing to think about, right? But it, it, this, this topic of forgiveness is going to... If you're a thinking person, it's going to produce things in your mind and questions that might not get answered today that I hope to be able to answer on this subject of forgiveness with one another and then, and then also teach this text of Scripture, these, these verses, and how it pertains to living in peace with one another. And that's what I believe these verses are teaching. Ken Sandy, who's the president of of Peacemaking Ministries, wrote in his book, The Peacemaker, A Biblical Guide to Resolving Personal Conflict. It's a book that I want to get for the library back there. Uh, it was a really good book to, for us to read. He says this, and it's true. Christians are the most forgiven people in the world. You, you agree with that? Christians are the most forgiven people in the world. Then he says this, Therefore, we should be the most forgiven people in the world. As most of us know from experience, he says, however, it is often difficult to forgive others genuinely and completely. We often find ourselves, he says, practicing a form of forgiveness that is neither biblical nor healing. We do that. And so the Word of God this morning tells us that we should bear with one another and we should forgive one another. If anyone has a complaint or a grievance against another, catch this, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Wow. That really, really tells us exactly the perfect example of how you and I ought to be handling our disputes with one another. And people, especially those of us who claim to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, how we are to settle our differences. How are we who know Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior, who are the family of God, and as we've talked about already, it's just like having a blood relationship. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, right? How do we live in peace with one another? How do we handle disputes? In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul rebukes the Corinthian church because they were taking each other to court. That's how they were handling their differences. Instead of forgiving or accepting wrong, they were taking one another to court and doing this in, uh, before the world. In other words, I've used this term before. We know we take our dirty laundry and we kind of let the world see it, right? And they were doing that before the world, and Paul rebuked them. As believers in Christ, we ought to know how to bear with one another, and we ought to know how to forgive one another. Now, obviously, there are certain cases and certain issues that we'll get to later on that are not unforgivable, but 
there's things that ways and 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 things that that need to happen in order for reconciliation to take place. But forgiveness is a whole other matter. Forgive, he says, as Christ has forgiven you. That's the example. And so forgiveness is a subject that I believe many people have a misunderstanding of what it means. What does it mean to forgive? Normally, someone will say to you after they do something wrong to you, they'll say, I'm sorry. Right? Or if you're from Canada, you will say what? Sorry. That's the only joke I'll tell this morning, all right? Sorry. We, uh, we have a Canadian in our home, so sometimes she lets it slip. She's not feeling well today. She has a headache, so pray for her. But that's, she, she's careful not to say it that way anymore. So it's, we, we say that. We say, sorry, right? And then, and then the person who said sorry it just expects you to forgive them. Let me ask you a question. Is that biblical? Is it biblical? Now, it depends. Sometimes there's a small matter. The, 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 the offense against you is just a small thing. They stepped on your toe. Sorry. I forgive you. It's okay. Right? Or they cut you off. And they yell out the window, sorry. Right? Not in New England, right? (laughs) But, you know, some people are nice, and they they say they're sorry for that. And you ought to have forgiveness in your heart. But there are some matters that are so hard and greater that it's, sorry won't cut it, buddy. There's a greater offense that that was done to you that is just, it takes more than just saying you're sorry. For instance, if if the same person steps on your toe continuously the same day, over and over again. Sorry, sorry. I mean, come on, right? Or you get cut off more than once in that day by the same person. It's probably happened before, right? Small world. But, you know, sorry sometimes doesn't cut it. And so we need to make sure we understand what forgiveness means. Things that are a more serious matter. How do you live with someone who offends you? Or maybe the situation requires that you can no longer live with the person. How does forgiveness relate to these things? What does it look like? Let me ask you a question. Is there a condition? Is there a condition on me granting forgiveness to somebody else? All of this is really important when it comes to living together in peace. And so before we define, and I'm careful to say it this way, what true biblical forgiveness means. The world has their definition of forgiveness. You can look in the dictionary for it, all right? But what does the Bible teach about forgiveness? That's what we need to know as Christians. Before I give you that definition, let me tell you a few things what it's not. Three things that forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Let me say it again. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It is an act of the will. It is a, you and I have to make a decision to forgive someone. And sometimes it's not an easy decision to make. And oftentimes it's very hard and very costly to forgive a person. It's not a feeling. It's a choice. And if we're honest, sometimes the person is hard to forgive. They might have done something really bad to us and And if forgiveness was a feeling, if we're honest, we're never going to feel like forgiving anybody. Or is that just me? No, I think it's true with all of us. We don't always feel like forgiving a person. If forgiveness was based on feelings, many people, if you think it that way, uh, you're walking around and you're not feeling like forgiving the person. You're probably still angry at them. Feeling forgiveness is not a feeling. Secondly, Forgiveness is not forgetting. Did you hear that? Forgiveness is not forgetting. Oftentimes, instead of forgiving the person, we just forget it. We go to our separate rooms, right? We had our argument. We've had our disagreements, and we just let time go by, and we try to forget the offense that was done to us, and that's not forgiveness. And oftentimes, we find ourselves bringing that offense back up again. 
because true forgiveness was not granted. We're trying to forget the offense, and we go to our separate rooms. If you're married to someone, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? And you're just trying to forget the offense, you're, but you've not, you've not gotten forgiveness. It reminds me of a lady who went to a pastor, excuse me, who went to a pastor for advice to help her with her marriage. When the pastor asked her what her greatest complaint was in her marriage, she replied, Every time we get into a fight, my husband gets historical. My husband gets historical. When the pastor heard it, he said, you must mean historic, hi, historical. Hi, his, oh, I can't even do it. <laughs> historical. Historical. Oh, my goodness. Hysterical. Thank you. Come back again, all right, please. <laughs> she responded, no, I mean exactly what I said. He, he keeps a mental record of everything I've done wrong, and whenever he gets mad, I get a history lesson. That's not forgiveness. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgetting is passive. It's a, a way or a process of dealing with an offense against you in which you hope the problem just fades away in time. But often that's not the case. How does a person forget some kind of abusive thing that happened to them in their life and forgive that person? How does a person forget an act of adultery that was committed against them. No, forgiveness is not forgetting. Instead, forgiveness is active. It's not passive. It involves a, a conscious choice and a deliberate course of action, much like God, who says this to you and I, I will remember your sins no more. I will remember your sins no more, Isaiah 43, 25. Listen to me. God is not saying I cannot remember your sins anymore. They slipped my mind. It's not God. It's impossible for that to happen. God is all-knowing. He is all-knowing. He, he cannot let things slip His mind. Listen to me. God makes a deliberate choice and a promise to remember your sins and my sins no more. It's not that He's forgetting them. He's making a choice. I am not going to remember your offense against me. As far as the east is to the west, that's how far I've forgiven you. And I, I, I've forgotten about it. I will no longer bring it up and rub it in your face. That's forgiveness. Thirdly, forgiveness is not excusing. So it's not a feeling, it's not forgetting, and it's not excusing. Remember, a sin was committed against you. And therefore, we cannot excuse sin and say, oh, it's just the it's just person's nature. It's, it's, it's what they do. And, and sometimes a wife might do this to a, a, a husband who's an alcoholic and, and maybe he's abusive and, and she's having company over. And so she cleans up all the mess from the night before, thinking it's an act of love to him. But it's not. It's excusing his behavior it is saying that his, his behavior is normal. It's accepting his behavior, and it's enabling his behavior to continue. It's excusing it and enabling it. And it's not okay to do something wrong to somebody and just kind of live with it. It's an offense against you, against me, and it needs to be dealt with correctly. So let me give you a biblical definition of forgiveness. To forgive is an act of obedience. God says we are to forgive one another, and it's an act of obedience to obey that. It's a promise to someone to release him or her from the liability or the punishment that that debt, that's what it is, that was incurred against you. You are releasing them from that penalty, and you promise to remember it no more. That's forgiveness. That is True, biblical forgiveness, and I'll give you some scriptures to prove it. There's a Greek word that forgiveness is used in the Bible. Aphemia is the Greek word that is often translated as forgive, and it means this. It means to let go. It means to release or to remit. It often refers to debts that have been paid or canceled in full. 
For instance, Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. He says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then in Matthew 18, 27, and the master of that servant was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him his, him the debt. You see it there? That's forgiveness. You're releasing the person. You're, you're not holding it against them anymore. Well, the scripture that we are looking at this morning in Colossians 3, verse 13, says, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. That's a different Greek word. Listen to this Greek word if I pronounce it properly. Charizomeia. Charizomeia. If you're familiar with any kinds of Greek words, you will notice that there's a, there's a word, a root word in that word forgive, and it's the word grace. Chariz, right? Charisma, right? Charismatic is the word grace. That's the word for forgive here in, in the Colossians 3 passage, and it means this, uh, to bestow favor freely or unconditionally. The, this word shows that forgiveness is undeserved. Did you hear that? Forgiveness is undeserved and it cannot be earned. Jesus teaches parable in Luke 7, verses 42 to 43, and it's about the servant where he had nothing with which to repay the master. The master, he freely forgave them both. They didn't deserve it. Tell me, therefore, Jesus says, which of them will love me more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said, you rightly judged. Notice also that forgiveness is connected to something. It's connected to what God has done for us in Christ Jesus, meaning our forgiveness is patterned after what, what Christ has done for us. It's patterned after God's forgiveness toward us. And that's what he says in Colossians 3, verse 13. Bearing with one another, forgiving one another. It's an act of grace. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. And then Ephesians 4, 32 is a parallel scripture where he says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. Over and over again, our forgiveness towards someone that has done something wrong to us, who has hurt us or offended us, is an act of grace toward them. In other words, the person who has offended us does not deserve forgiveness. They have incurred a debt toward us. They owe us. We don't owe them anything. Granting forgiveness is an act of grace. And we know this because of the Greek word and also because of what Christ has done for us. He patterns our forgiveness. And so let's look at this a little deeper here. What has Christ forgiven us of? What has He forgiven us of? He's forgiven us of, of a debt. We earn something. Are you listening to me? We earn something when we sinned against Christ. We didn't earn forgiveness. We don't deserve it. We earned a punishment, a debt. And so forgiveness is a costly activity. It, it cost somebody something. A debt has been incurred against the person that you've offended. Most of this debt, brothers and sisters, is owed to God. For all sin is against God. All of our offenses against each other is really an offense against God. We are breaking His commandments. God has given us the standard of how we ought to live and how we ought to be treating one another. And when we offend somebody, we are sinning against God. As David says, that my sin is against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil deed before you, God. And so God is owed that debt to God because He's the one who we are sinning against. But thankfully... We can forgive others because we've been forgiven. We've been forgiven because Christ hung on the cross for your sin and my sin, and He forgave us. If you've received Christ as your Savior, you've received His forgiveness. You're forgiven against God, and He doesn't hold that against you anymore, no matter how many times you mess up. Isn't that a wonderful thing that, that we know that when God forgives us, He does not hold it against us. He's forgiven us. And he wants us to practice the same kind of forgiveness toward each other. 
That's a hard thing to do. Amen? Or oh me. It's a very hard thing to do. But not only is the debt owed to God, listen to me, in part, the debt is owed against you or a person you've sinned against. Part of that debt is owed to that person. This means you have a choice to make. Remember, forgiveness is based on Christ's forgiveness toward us. It is a gospel thing. So we have a choice to make. We can either take payments on that debt or we can make payments on that debt. We can take payments or we can make payments. You can take or extract payments on the debt of someone's sin against you. And what normally is done, it's a sinful, wrong way to handle an offense against you. And you're going to relate to this because I'm sure you've done this before. I know I've done it. But the way that we, we take or extract payments against something that's been done to us for sinful, wrong ways, is some, one way is we withhold forgiveness. I'm not going to forgive you. I know you've done that because people do that, right? I'm not going to forgive you. Or we dwell on the wrong. We let it get us bitter and, and we're getting angry. Uh, we can become cold and callous toward the person who's offended us. It's the sinful ways of handling the offense against us. We can, we can give up on the relationship. Many people do that. They just give up on the relationship. We can, af- we can afflict emotional pain and become manipulative to the person that has offended us. We can lash back. We can seek revenge and try to get that payment ourselves. Many of us have done that, and I know I have. These actions may provide a temporary, although perverse, pleasure for the moment. But they exact a high price from you and I in the long run. Someone once said, unforgiveness is the poison we drink, hoping others will die. I said that we have a choice to make. We can forgive. We can take payments or we can make a payment. We have that choice to become bitter and make the matters worse for them and for ourselves. Or we can make a choice to forgive that person. We can release them from from the debt that was owed to us, against us. Sometimes this is done with one easy payment. One easy payment. And you cancel the person's debt in your heart against them. That was against you, I mean. You just cancel it. Because maybe the debt was a small matter. And love covers a multitude of sins. And and if it's somebody that you love and care about and they've offended you, they've done something wrong to you, or even if it was a small matter and that, that payment is easy, I forgive you. But sometimes there's deep hurt from things that were done to us. And we need the same grace of God that was shown toward us. When God forgave us, we need to show toward that individual You and I might have to practice bearing with one another and dealing with the effects of that person's sin for a long period of time. The pain doesn't just go away. You grant forgiveness, but the pain doesn't go away. It may involve fighting against painful memories that are in your head and in your heart. Words spoken sometimes are more hurtful than the actual physical pain that is given to us. You might have to put on the tender mercies of Christ and be able to speak gracious words to the individual that you really want to lash out at and say something unkind back to them. But in your heart, you know you ought to forgive them and you forgave them, but it's hard. Forgiveness is extremely costly, but the scriptures say we must forgive one another. It's an act of grace, a debt against us is paid by us forgiving that individual as Christ forgave us. Now, as I bring this message to a close, I want to ask you a question. Listen to me carefully. Is there a condition to forgiveness? Is there a condition to forgiveness? Meaning, am I to grant forgiveness to the person regardless of their attitude regardless of them asking for it or regardless of them confessing what they've done to me was wrong or regardless of their, their repentance? Or should I just grant the individual 
forgiveness no matter what? Or is there a condition to forgiveness? Think carefully. The answer to this really depends on the offense, does it not? Meaning, if it was a small matter that was done to you, love covers a multitude of sins and therefore an offense is easily covered because of love. Amen? And we're to put on love, which is the bond of perfection, God's Word tells us. But if it's a more serious matter, that we like we've already discussed, our basis for forgiving them is based on who? On how Christ has forgiven us. And so if we try to forgive a person apart from the example and the pattern of Christ's forgiveness toward us, then we are forgiving them in an unbiblical way. Are you tracking with me? We need to follow His pattern of forgiveness. And I believe that there are two stages to forgiveness. Two stages to it. One is an attitude of forgiveness that every believer ought to be carrying with them. You ought to be armed with forgiveness at all times. Scriptures tell us here to put on the tender mercies of Christ. You are the elect of God. Be walking on in mercies and kindness and humility and meekness and long suffering. Put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Right? This is the, the believer's clothing. This is what we're wearing. We are to live this way before each other, bearing with one another. And so forgiveness is an attitude of the heart that I am always to be armed with, with an attitude of of forgiveness. Now listen, I'm preaching this, brothers and sisters, but I'll tell you right now, it is not an easy place to be. I'm still a sinner. What are you looking at me funny for? So are you. We're all sinners, and this is a hard place to be, but by the grace of God, and this is why this context of these verses that I'm going to come back to, that tell us how we can wear this and live this way, because this is what a Christian life is all about. Bearing with one another, forgiving. And so forgiveness. I'm always to have an attitude of forgiveness toward anybody and everybody. So should you. But the actual granting of forgiveness, well, there's a condition to that. Just like there's a condition on you and I getting forgiveness from God. It's called confession and it's called repentance. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful to what? To forgive you and to cleanse you from all unright. And so there needs to be confession. There needs to be repentance before the actual forgiveness is granted to the individual. But granting forgiveness is probably one of the hardest things you and I can do. It is hard to do that. But brothers and sisters, preach it to yourself. It is the right thing to do. In your heart, Be always ready to forgive. And if that person confesses to you they're wrong and they ask you for forgiveness, grant them forgiveness. Grant it to them. Just as He, God, has forgiven you and I and He's remembered our sin no more, you and I can no longer bring that up. That matter up is under the blood of Christ. And so there's enough forgiveness in God's heart to be given to you and I to be able to forgive another person's offense against you and against me. Now, let me let you know, and we're going to get in deeper to this in the coming weeks. This does not mean that the relationship is restored, that everything now is hunky-dory because I forgave you. No. There are steps of reconciliation that need to take place, though. Forgiveness has been granted, but... Things are not the way they always been. But you did what the Lord required of you to do. You forgave that person a debt that was against you. Now, there are many, many other, other matters to bring up. I'll give you a few of them in closing. What about repentance? What does it look like? True repentance? Not just saying, I'm sorry. You won't find that in the Bible, brothers and sisters. It's confession of sin. What does that mean? It's repentance. What does that mean? Question for you. What about the consequences of the person's actions? Are there or should there be consequences for sins that were committed against us? 
Do I wait on forgiveness until those consequences are worked out? What about reconciliation? What if the person has done something to me that's so great of of an offense that does that mean I am automatically now restore my relationship with them and I trust them like I used to? What about abuse? What about criminal acts that were committed? Well, I hope to work through all of this. And then the real, the real question is this. How is all of any of this possible? How can I live this way? How can I have my heart armed with forgiveness? God's Word has wisdom for us. Before I close in prayer, forgiveness is probably the most important subject in the Bible. It is the most important subject in the Bible. You know why? Without forgiveness, nobody's going to be in heaven. You agree with that? And so if you're sitting here this morning and you don't have God's forgiveness, if God has not granted you forgiveness, that means that you, you're, you're, you're walking a fine line right now. You're acting as though you know when you're going to die. You're acting as though you are all set with God and He's your friend and you and Him have an understanding. You won't find that in the Bible either. No. God's not your friend. He wants to be your Savior. And He wants to save you and grant you forgiveness so that you can be in heaven with Him someday. And if you want that kind of forgiveness, that vertical relationship, He will grant you forgiveness and it's through His Son, the Lord Jesus who died for your sins. Let me ask you a question as you sit here this morning. Have you ever turned from that sin? Has your attitude regarding your sin bothered you to such a point that you turn from it and you say, I don't want to live this way anymore? I I need God's forgiveness? I need a Savior? Have you ever came to that place in your life where you just got tired of your sin and you see what it does to your family and your friends and your and people around you, and you've repented and said, I want to change, and you looked up and said, God, save me. It can happen today, but it hasn't happened yet. But if it hasn't happened, that means God hasn't forgiven you. And you sit here this morning with no forgiveness from God. That's a terrible place to be. Because if you don't have His forgiveness, you have no forgiveness to work with, no grace to work with. So when someone offends you, you can't really forgive them the way God God has forgiven you. You understand what I'm saying? And so vertical forgiveness enables you to live in horizontal relationships to be able to forgive one another. Amen? That should be a better amen. Amen. And so we come to the Lord this morning and we ask Him to search our hearts and ask ask Him to reveal to us, Lord, am I forgiven? Maybe you need to be saying that to yourself right now. Am I forgiven, Lord? And then maybe there's someone you're sitting next to, someone that is home right now, someone that should be in church right now, or someone that you know you've offended them and you've never gone to them and asked them for forgiveness. You just maybe didn't feel like it. Or maybe you've forgotten about it. And now, let me tell you something, they probably haven't forgotten about it. Maybe you're just making excuses for it, you're justifying your actions. I pray after today's message, you will pray for God to create a divine appointment so you can talk to that individual and get their forgiveness. Or maybe you need to be forgiven. Someone's offended you and they, they, they don't get it. They don't realize that they've offended you, and that's possible. Can you in your heart forgive them? God wants you to forgive them. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and think about this message that we just heard. Prepare your hearts for the Lord's Supper as we, the different Sunday where we're going to have a time of worship around the Lord's Supper. But perhaps this morning as we are praying and preparing our hearts for that table to come around, you need to ask God for forgiveness.